Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the third annual virtual TSM conference. This year's theme is Redefining Recovery. I am Jenny Williamson, Executive Director of the C3 Foundation, and I am so glad that you guys have joined us for this event. The conference is available to view and participate in for free thanks to our two co-headline sponsors, RIA Health and Work at Health, and our panel and intermission sponsors, Alcure, Deerhaven Gardens, Paragon Health Partners, SinclairMethod.org, Alcohol Recovery Medicine, and our generous sponsors who have subsidized panel and intermission sponsorships of our own Your Sinclair Method Coaching and Hero Recurring Donation Programs. If you would like to support the work of the C3 Foundation, there is a donation link in our profile, and we have a timer that will also drop a donation link into the chat during the broadcast. Also, if you're on Twitter, please feel free to live tweet our conference with the hashtags Redefining Recovery and Options Save Lives. It's a great way to amplify the impact of our conference. So before we begin Claudia's keynote, I want to acknowledge the volunteers who have or will contribute their time and energy into making this year's conference a success. I wanna start by thanking our loyal weekly live stream viewers. Your enthusiasm and support continues to keep our live broadcasts interactive and it enables us to continue practicing all of the technical steps that go into the entire process of broadcasting live content. I mean, if you guys saw my checklists for this conference, uh, you'd probably be with me under a table curled up in a ball somewhere just sobbing <laughs> but uh, the checklists get me through and so does your enthusiasm and your support so thank you all uh, I know a lot of you have been with us all 26 weeks leading up into this week's conference and I really appreciate your support Next, I'd like to thank our two moderators for the conference. You'll see them out and about all weekend, Freddie and Mudforce, and all of those who are volunteering to ensure that if I forget to turn my mic on or off, that they're going to let me know right away to keep things running smoothly. Finally, I'd like to thank my favorite co-conspirator and friend, Claudia, without whom the C3 Foundation wouldn't even exist. Nine years ago this weekend, Claudia incorporated C3 Foundation as a nonprofit and started us all on this amazing journey together that has led us here to our third annual conference and our fourth Global Sinclair Method Awareness Day that happens on Sunday. As many of you know, Claudia is still a working actress and a creator in addition to all her duties here at C3. So. We needed to record her keynote in advance so that she could still participate in spite of a travel schedule that can be unpredictable at times. And it's a good thing we did because she is currently out of the country. And so without any further ado, let me go ahead and debut her keynote speech. Hello everyone, I'm Claudia Christian, and we are here this weekend to kick off the third annual Sinclair Method virtual conference. And this year's theme, Redefining Recovery, is a personal one for me. Over the years, my concept of recovery has evolved, starting from a tentative acceptance of popular societal beliefs on the topic to questioning and then slowly defining what recovery means to me. If we truly want to make a difference, and empower people to overcome addiction, it's important that we all continue to look inward and challenge ourselves and our own beliefs. And it's essential to critically examine not only the definition of recovery, but also the practice of it in order to make recovery something that can happen. So tonight, I wanna to share with you how I have continued to redefine my own idea of recovery over the years. My life was pretty good good until alcohol hijacked it in my late 30s. I had a really outdoorsy childhood in Connecticut filled with nature and animals and lots of books. And I had this ever present dream of becoming an actress and a writer when I grew up. I was blessed enough to have those dreams come true. And in my late teens, I starred in many TV series and on into my 20s. And I ended up being a published author of six books. I've had some extraordinary experiences in my life and I've, I've known an array of fascinating people. 
And I've really never lost focus on how fortunate I've been to travel the world and do what I love to do and work with very interesting people. I drank along the way, but nothing that would get in the way of my career. I was a really hard worker. I was focused on success and also on creating a future for myself. From a very young age, I had this strong belief that I should take care of myself and I should buy a home and make sure that I never rely on anybody else because at heart, I always was and always have been a bit of a loner. I am a classic introverted extrovert as so many of us performers are. I had a sibling who struggled with substance abuse, but I just chalked it up to the trauma that he experienced as a teenager. I visited him in rehab, I tried to make him laugh and I figured that he would just get over it. I also had an uncle who died of alcohol related causes, but that too, I justified by saying, well, he was in World War II, he was bombed down, he was buried for a week, he must have experienced extreme trauma, par for the course. I mean, I knew nothing about addiction and even less about recovery. It never crossed my mind that someone like me, who was living her dreams, could also find her way down that dark, inhospitable landscape of hell that is addiction. When I began to notice that my own drinking was increasing, I tried abstinence only to relapse time and time again, like so many do. And then I tried whatever was available to me at the time, anything, anything at all, but nothing was helpful, at least not for long. Until this point, when someone said that they were in recovery, it always struck me as odd. I mean, how long is this recovery supposed to last? If they were sober from the substance that hurt them, why couldn't they just state that they were recovered? Were they going to be searching for this apparently elusive thing called recovery for their entire life? Talk about intimidating. Even through those early struggles, I carried this cognitive dissonance with me. I mean, how could recovery be expected to work if there was no clear endpoint? Aren't goals supposed to be achievable? When people deal with a disease or a physical issue, it's commonly accepted that they seek medical treatment and the majority of time the injury, disease, or condition gets resolved or healed. Maybe they go into remission or they heal a broken bone, whatever. Addiction to me seemed like an affliction that was being treated with impractical measures, reading from an ancient text, playing with horses, talking about one's past, Greek group meetings run by people whose only credentials were that they too had suffered an addiction. None of this seemed logical to me because I was beginning to see addiction as a medical issue in need of a medical solution. I eventually, luckily, found my way to Dr. Roy Escapa's book, The Cure for Alcoholism and the Sinclair Method, which eliminated my cravings, both mental, mental and physical. And cravings were the reason why I continued to relapse. And TSM freed me from those. When I finally met Dr. Escapa and I was able to discuss his quest to make Dr. David Sinclair's work more well-known, I recognized this would become my calling as well. His empathy and matter-of-factness about addiction were refreshing and his lack of judgment was a balm to my weary soul. Dr. Escapa asked me to write a book about my experience on TSM. How could I refuse? Eventually, I also met Dr. Sinclair, an amazing man. I was struck by this humble, generous individual who firmly believed that people suffering from substance misuse were not bad people. They were simply badly wired. <laughs> this was a revelation to me. There was nothing spiritually wrong with me. I just needed to shrink my neural pathways back to normal and get on with my life. It was truly liberating. I will never lose sight of the fact that those two men and their commitment to making this method known are 100% responsible for saving my life. And I am grateful for their work daily. Once I committed to coming out of the closet as an alcoholic, I decided to devote my life to advocating for the Sinclair method. After all, it was life-saving. And writing Babylon Confidential was liberating. It's helped many people examine their own drinking issues, but with less shame and more openness and honesty. After publication, I was bombarded with emails from people who were struggling, and I began to informally coach individuals around the world I realized quickly that this was unsustainable. <laughs> By 2013, I had had enough. I needed help and a place where people could find the answers that they needed quickly. 
at that point, I had been on TSM for four glorious years. I traveled, I socialized, I lived all without a single binge. And I knew in my heart that I needed to create a safe place for people to find information on about TSM. And that space took the form of a nonprofit organization. Luckily, I found the perfect person to work with. And C3 Foundation was started with Jenny Williamson, who we all owe so much to, and who would eventually become executive director of C3 Foundation. We began life as a six-page website and slowly started adding resources. At this point, the book was getting great reviews. The website for C3 Foundation was providing much needed resources, but it still wasn't enough. Let's face it. We're a visual society and people have a very limited attention span. So I decided to make a documentary film. We started the process of raising funds, which is always so much fun. <laughs> but I cannot talk about the film without thanking my sci-fi fans around the globe, seriously. The, they funded One Little Pill, they really did. I'm grateful to those who funded it and for those who took the chance to show it to someone who was looking for a solution to their drinking. The film won an award and it's been seen by many, many people. It's an amazing educational and intervention tool used both by those who are on the Sinclair method to explain it to their loved ones or used by loved ones to show it to someone that they're worried about their drinking. In spite of the success that we were having, I, I also witnessed a lot of frustration those first few years is I heard from people sent to traditional treatment only to relapse time and time again. I heard stories from these brave, brave individuals that were, that were brave enough to address their drinking with their primary care physician, who were then left deflated and ridiculed or told to just cut down or go to a meeting. It angered me that so few doctors knew about TSM and naltrexone, but to some extent, I understood why. AA and rehabs built on 12-step philosophy had been positioned for decades as the only way to truly recover from addiction. That shaped medical training, where the gold standard so-called treatment for anyone who wasn't an addiction specialist was for them to conduct an SBIRT, which stands for Screening, Brief Interve Intervention and Referral to Treatment. Under these medical guidelines, Family doctors were actively taught that someone else should treat their patients for alcohol addiction. And that typically meant going to a specialist who would then prescribe AA meetings. The prevailing belief, belief in AA is that you cannot take any medication to help with substance abuse. And this has always sounded like an unnecessary punishment to me. The judgment and shame inducing failure rate in traditional treatment, along with the alcohol deprivation effect, was causing people to get worse, not better. So many people simply gave up and dozens disappeared from the AA meetings that I was attending before I found TSM. I worried for them and I began to take it very personally that people with AUD were being treated like failures or worse. I also firmly believe that Bill W or any of his associates known, had known about targeted use of naltrexone, that they would have used it in a heartbeat. I mean, these were men who were trying massive doses of niacin and LSD to treat their own alcohol misuse. So why the heck wouldn't they have latched onto TSM? These were the same men who wrote, quote, physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there is no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet, end quote. And back in the 1930s, they were absolutely correct. Science had not yet progressed in ways to understand the neurofunctionality of the brain. Opiate receptors in the brain weren't even discovered until the 1970s. That's 40 years after the writing of the big book. But we don't live in the 1930s anymore. And science has finally accomplished the task of making a normal drinker out of someone who was previously addicted to alcohol. We decided to use this knowledge and attend some addiction conferences in hopes of learning how the Sinclair method would naturally fit within the existing landscape of recovery. We were eager to learn about treatment gaps and find ways to work alongside others who shared our mission of helping people recover from alcohol addiction. We thought the issue was that the medical and mental health professions 
were simply unaware that using opiate antagonists could produce extinction and empower people to have the full recovery they so desperately wanted, needed, and deserved. Our first few forays <laughs> were a letdown, to say the least. We attended a conference in DC, and we were very excited to attend a talk about prevention. Prevention. Imagine our shock when there were literally only five people in the entire room. It was the two of us, Jenny and me, <laughs> two presenters, and one other person. That was the sum total of individuals interested in how to prevent excess drinking at an addiction conference. <laughs> so by a group boasting a nearly six-figure membership at the time, which was laden with booths advertising pricey rehab facilities with abysmal success rates and a revolving door business model. We were floored that no one seemed interested in prevention or harm reduction. They only supported the existing models of abstinence-based treatment, and they actually looked down on us as usurpers. It seemed as though many clung to the bad press that moderation management had received more than 10 years prior when its founder was involved in a fatal wreck while intoxicated. Mental health professionals zeroed in on this one moment in time in an attempt to discredit harm reduction entirely. Even at our most recent conference this April, someone stopped by the table and told us that we probably shouldn't tell people that TSM can be used in conjunction with moderation management because then people will know it won't work which is absolutely ridiculous because the two work very well together for people who don't have a goal of abstinence. But if medication for treating alcohol use disorder is underutilized now, in 2003, it was non-existent by comparison. So through false equivalencies and closed minds, without even looking at the science behind the Sinclair method and without considering that the treatment is quite literally built on Ivan Pavlov's work of conditioning and extinction, TSM was looked at as some sort of snake oil, like it's too good to be true, pipe dream, nonsense. Dismissed by people who spoke wonderful words about patient-centered treatment, but practiced a my way or the highway approach to the people they were supposed to be helping. We were disappointed, to say the least, and frankly shocked that the strongest pushback came from people who were supposed to be helping others recover. Instead, they all seemed to focus on the bottom line, choosing the dollar over successful outcomes. One gal at a conference actually had the temerity to ask me, well, if this TSM thing takes off, what will we do for work? <laughs> I mean, what the heck? Maybe we were naive to think that the people who worked as recovery professionals were in it for more than just the steady paycheck. We really wanted to believe that these people shared the same goals that we did and still do today to meet people where they are and assist them in overcoming alcohol use disorder on their terms and with their goals. Not only did this experience make us realize that we could not fit into the recovery industry. No, no. We fully understood that we did not want to fit in. No way. It was clear that their definition of recovery was wound tightly around abstinence through willpower. The Sinclair method with harm reduction at its core and a medication to fight the cravings stood in stark contrast to everything they believed recovery should be. Meanwhile, people were literally suffering and dying. We knew we wanted, no, we needed to build something better, more humane, and more effective. And we knew we would have to be the ones to lay the foundation for that on our own. At dinner that night, Jenny and I made a commitment to each other and to all of the people suffering from alcohol use disorder. People with AUD and their loved ones deserved better. And we would fight this no matter what the pushback was from those unwilling to even listen, let alone understand. And we have clung to that commitment through every trying experience that we've had. I often wonder why anyone in recovery would hinder another person's recovery. It doesn't make any sense to me. I know how difficult it is to find freedom from addiction. So why would I not support any process or treatment that could help 
any individual. At times, it seems like the recovery world is a very inhospitable place, to be honest. I've said it before, but it's worth repeating. Recovery is no place for a my way or the highway attitude. We need options. Options save lives. We decided that instead of trying to fit into the recovery industry, we would aim to replace it, to build something better, and to give people a viable science-based option to treat their AUD. If the traditional system that keeps failing people makes itself irrelevant through closed-mindedness and an inability to put the people it's supposed to be helping first, then so be it. We cannot change what we cannot control, but we can lead the way for anyone else who truly wants to make a difference in the lives of people suffering from AUD, their families, and society as a whole. Instead of looking to the recovery industry for inspiration and collaboration, it became a cautionary symbol for everything we wanted to avoid becoming. We stopped scanning the horizon for allies to our cause and began, began creating allies through education. Instead of attending conferences, we started exhibiting at them. At first, it led us to a battle against misinformation. We invited that with a banner that asked directly, what if everything you've been told about alcoholism is wrong? That attracted attention. Some of the more blatant misconceptions would be amusing if they weren't so harmful. People claiming online that naltrexone is a replacement drug. It's not. You do not derive any pleasure from naltrexone. People saying that it's addictive. It's not. Doctors who claim they need permission from the DEA to prescribe it. Really, we've heard this more than once. Yeah. And people who claim that naltrexone is dangerous. And all of these misconceptions and, and incorrect information has led to confusion and delay in treatment. Again, it's been available for decades, so the safety profile is easy to verify. And then there's this gem, that Dr. Sinclair's work isn't valid because he didn't include the success of the naltrexone shot in his research, which is laughable because the shot didn't come along for more than a decade after Dr. Sinclair published his work on targeted pharmacological extinction. And now you can see what we're up against, folks. Despite the pushback and a whole lot of nonsensical misinformation, we managed to step into a much larger playing field with the help of the London Business School, uh, who invited me to do a TEDx talk in 2016. This was a major, major accomplishment. It, it is, really has helped millions of people. I think at this point, it has had almost 4 million views. That's a lot of people. And it's helped legitimize TSM, and it certainly made naltrexone uh, more of a household name. So I'm really happy that they gave me that opportunity, and a big thanks to them again. I also spoke at the US Senate in 2016 about harm reduction in hopes of educating lawmakers and exposing the very, very narrow and few options that people have in the US for dealing with excess drinking. And soon after the joint session um, at the Senate and after the TEDx talk, I was asked to participate in an NBC special on alcohol misuse hosted by Megyn Kelly, which brought even more attention to medication assisted treatment and TSM specifically. So the TEDx, the Senate briefing, and NBC special all happened as we began exhibiting at addiction conferences and helped us create a positive feedback loop. The public was hearing the message and reaching out to C3 Foundation for help. And I had a constant stream of people from around the world contacting me directly through social media. And finally, the medical community was beginning to listen. And in that community were telemedicine providers capable of offering treatment in a private, convenient way. More medical providers meant more people who got the help they needed, which in turn caused even more people to know about TSM. As the volume of people finding the Sinclair method began to swell, thankfully, so did the number of medical professionals who began offering TSM. When we were finally able to announce that there was at least one TSM provider in every single state in the USA, let me tell you, we could not have been more elated. 
And from 2009, there was only the amazing Dr. Stephen Cox in Kentucky using TSM to 2022 when anyone in the USA can find a TSM provider in their state. Now that's progress. In addition to the US, other countries like Canada are completely covered and the UK and Europe have made tremendous strides making naltrexone and nalmefene more readily available. I said it would take a decade <laughs> to reach a tipping point. <laughs> well, folks, we are one year away from 10 years, being 10 years old, C3 Foundation. And I have to say that as tough as times get, things are looking better and better every year. All this growth led to expanding our support communities. One of the most gratifying things about social media is the community it builds. We had started our moderated Option Save Lives Forum back in 2014, but we knew we needed more outlets for people to choose from. Support, like our evolving ideas about rec what recovery meant, needed to meet people where they were and target special segments using Facebook groups. We saw the need for a beginner's group and we filled that, all while ensuring that proper care and advice remained the focus so that no misconceptions or inaccuracies could cloud the experience for the individual seeking help for their drinking. We also saw the need for support for loved ones of people who are on TSM and started a group specifically for them. We also have communities of supporters on Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, and Discord. We have at this point over 10,000 people around the world in our little community. The downside of social media is that things live on. Things that I wish I could change. My story and the core of my TEDx talk, including getting my medication from an overseas pharmacy, not so great. <laughs> but way back then, it was the only option that I had. The reason we work so hard at elevating the Sinclair method is so that nobody else has to do that. So I may have said in my TED talk that I got my medication online, but nobody else has to do this anymore. So um, I wish I could go back into my TED talk and remove that sentence so people don't keep reaching out to us <laughs> saying, what's that Indian pharmacy? <laughs> you don't have to get it from an Indian pharmacy anymore, folks. <laughs> it's very, very dangerous to buy medications online. Um, in some places, it's actually illegal. And also some people have received medications that they did not order. So you don't even know what you're getting. So just go the safe route and use our resources. I also focused on the biological aspect of addiction and really didn't address trauma as much as I should have. I was stubborn in my belief that the majority of my issue was craving and that once that that was under control, I would be free. But subsequent years on TSM taught me that recovery is far more than simply getting one's cravings under control. It's really a time to mature and to face the past pains that you've shoved aside or attempted to silence with alcohol. It's a time to forgive and to move past traumas, to become a more balanced individual, one who is capable of sharing your experiences to help others and not hoarding your hurts or worse, hiding them. It's a time to truly face and understand why we use substances to push down our emotions or feelings or to just disappear and why we fear success and failure in life. All of these things are part of recovery and they take time and help. All of these things also involve so much more than just the biological aspect of addiction. But at the time I was just so focused on the why that I could barely recognize the how. I recovered in public, that was my choice and I do not regret it. But I do hope that my 13 year journey has been a lesson and an inspiration to people. And I will gladly offer up my mistakes and my lessons to anyone who's willing to learn from them. And believe me, I have a lot of them. I hope that people can see that my views on recovery continue to evolve. And I hope that they can find the courage within themselves to challenge their own views on recovery. Recovery is not just about quitting the substance that's harming you. It's about reclaiming yourself and in some cases, finding yourself. You know, people talk about facing demons. Well, no one who has not walked in the path of addiction can truly understand what the addiction demon really feels like. 
I have spoken many times about feeling as if I was taken over by an alien or like if my brain was hijacked. And I have to say that the feeling of losing oneself, really losing oneself has to be the single most frightening thing I've ever experienced in my life. More frightening than rape, death or loss. And I have experienced all of those things. Losing oneself is not just debilitating, it is utterly terrifying. So when the moment comes when you feel free from this madness that is addiction, free from this demon and finally yourself again, it is quite simply the best feeling a human being can feel. For me, it was the happiest moment of my life when I realized that I was free. That to me is recovery or more specifically to be recovered. I have recovered, me, myself, Claudia. And that's why I keep fighting this fight. I want every individual who feels like they cannot see themselves in the mirror anymore to once again recognize their reflection and feel good about that person looking back at them. I want them to feel the peace that comes with the knowledge that alcohol can no longer touch them or harm them and the happiness that comes from waking up in the morning and knowing that the lizard is asleep or better yet, dead. That is the kind of full on recovery that I wish for everyone. A complete recovery of mind, body and spirit. A recovery of, of relationships and creativity and love. This complete recovery can only come when one puts the compulsion and cravings to rest, and I personally could not have done it without science, naltrexone, and the work of Dr. David Sinclair. My hope remains that anyone and everyone has access to the same method that set me free. And we will continue to work tirelessly to ensure that that is possible. One of the most important things about our support communities is that it challenges us to keep listening and learning and responding to the constantly changing needs of individuals who are on TSM. We are continuing fielding questions like, what does TSM success look like? And how is the 78% success rate defined? And so, am I cured, in remission, in recovery, recovered, or what? And how will I know? It's easy to say that success is defined by freedom from craving or that when you regain the choice of when, if, how much, or when to stop drinking alcohol, then you've made it. But people like quantifiable metrics when it comes to success. Because traditional abstinence-based treatment is black and white or pass and fail, if you will, it's easy to define success. No alcohol equals success, any alcohol equals failure. Harm reduction, including the use of TSM, exists in the gray area. We have long asserted that success with the Sinclair method is either the elimination of alcohol entirely or a significant reduction of alcohol use at or below the established threshold for moderate drinking guidelines. No binges, no blackouts, no spiraling out of control because a sip of alcohol turns into an epic relapse. And success is achieved through time, repetition, support, and 100% medication adherence. But until recently, many have continued to scoff at this definition. Quote, if an alcoholic wants to drink, why would they take the pill? We're constantly asked. But the bigger question is, if someone with AUD wants to learn to stop drinking uncontrollably, why would you deny them a medication that has scientific and clinical success in doing exactly that? After all, if you don't think they're going to take a pill to stop drinking, what on earth makes you think they're just going to stop drinking entirely on their own? In recent weeks, NIA, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, has released a new definition of recovery from alcohol use disorder, and it fits in line with, with what we've been saying all along, that harm reduction is a far more realistic goal for the majority of individuals. The NIA definition is this. 
Recovery is a process through which an individual pursues both remission from alcohol use disorder and cessation from heavy drinking. An individual may be considered recovered if both remission from AUD and cessation from heavy drinking are achieved and maintained over time. For those experiencing alcohol-related functional impairment and other adverse consequences, recovery is often marked by the fulfillment of basic needs, enhancements in social support and spirituality, and improvements in physical and mental health quality of life and other dimensions of well-being. Continued improvement in these domains may in turn promise sustained recovery. Now, this new take on recovery, which does not require 100% abstinence, makes far more sense and is much more attainable for most people. I am personally thrilled with this change, and I know that Jenny was thrilled when she read it. I am very, very proud of what C3 Foundation has accomplished at this, and this conference is really part of it. This third conference, I should say. I am thrilled that this conference has been so well received and has educated and supported so many individuals in every realm of recovery. And I'm incredibly excited to hear the inspiring talks and I'm grateful to everyone who's participated in making our third annual TSM conference a reality. I would like to extend my thanks to Jenny Williamson for her endless commitment to C3 Foundation. Without her, we would not have a C3 Foundation. We would not have succeeded or continued in our fight to change the face of addiction treatment. So bravo, brava, Jenny. <laughs> you know, I often wonder what my life would have been like without the struggle of addiction. And I've come to the conclusion that it would have been far less satisfying. I know that might sound a little bit strange, but when I decided to share my journey on the Sinclair Method with the world, I, I really knew that I would always be labeled as an alcoholic. But I also knew that this method would save lives and that I quite simply would not have been able to live with myself if I didn't share it with the world. I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror if I would have kept this to myself because TSM does save lives. I've changed because of my advocacy. I've experienced the joy of helping others and the massive difference it can make in a person's life to simply care enough to listen and to offer up some hope. These are the basic tenements of life to help others, to love and to be kind. What better way to do this than to advocate a treatment that quite literally does save lives and save my life. You can all help this mission yourself by simply talking about TSM. It's really, truly as simple as that. Just talk about it everywhere. I used to talk about it in gyms, at parties, at doctor's offices, <laughs> social occasions, you name it. So just share this life-saving information with as many people as you can, including your own doctors. That is truly helping spread the word. I appreciate your time your energy and your willingness to change the way people who are misusing alcohol are treated. And I thank all of the participants and I hope you all learned something of value this weekend. Thank you so much for attending our third annual conference. Please enjoy and thank you. All right. Wow. Um, all right. So what did you guys think? I'd love to take any questions you guys might have in the, uh, in the chat. Um, so go ahead and if you have questions, drop them into the chat. I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, this is really it for today. We were just kicking everything off tonight with Claudia's talk and then uh tomorrow i will be back on the air at beginning at 9 30 for a quick welcome with our first panel happening at 10 o'clock we're gonna have panels starting on the hour everything's eastern time um and we're gonna hear from somebody talking about residential treatment with the sinclair method which is now a reality we're gonna hear 
about the need for reforming substance use disorder treatment in general from the perspective of child welfare. We're going to talk about alcohol use disorder and coping, um, and we're going to have some TSM success panels over the week. Uh, so I really do hope that you guys drop back in and out throughout the rest of the weekend. Uh, we've got two more days of our conference, and we're just we're really thrilled that you guys are here that we're able to put out all of this content for free if you miss anything along the way we will have all of the videos uh, up in their entirety uh, most likely next week uh, but the entire conference will stay on twitch for a couple of weeks on its own before uh, as we get things moved over to our youtube our vimeo and our website so if no one has questions then that is it uh and yes uh, uh the question is yes they they are all going to be available later uh we're keeping everything for free we're keeping everything available uh the big point behind these conferences is to just grow the amount of free available resources and information that people can get um about the sinclair method and again we thank our we thank our sponsors our co-headline sponsors work at health and ria health uh, all of our panel sponsors, all of our intermission sponsors, and you know we're and each one of you because you know clip clip the videos, share the videos, host them if you have your own Twitch channel, um, talk about them. Just you know help us spread the word because C three Foundation is myself and Claudia. But our C3 family includes you. So we appreciate you. And we will see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody.